Hello, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our final MENA 2021 Back to School workshop. I can see a few people in the chat box already saying hello. Good evening to you all, uh, people in Saudi Arabia there. Lovely to have you with us once again. Hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. I'm going to try and up the volume of my voice a little bit. Try and hold it for the workshop. I hope you're all doing well wherever you are. Good evening. This evening, we are going to be looking at using projects with our young learners. Thank you very much, Mohammed. It's very kind of you. We're going to be looking at using projects with our young learners. And we really want uh, 2021 to 2022 academic year to be as engaging, as motivating, as exciting, uh, fun, but also uh, enriching in terms of English as much as possible. We've heard lots of uh, comments about students falling behind, lost learning, all of these kinds of things. Project-based learning is a great way to try and bring our students forward as much as possible. So for the next hour, we're going to be looking at this particular topic. I'm sure by now most of you know me. I'm sure you've either been to one of the workshops back to school or you've seen me somewhere on the internet, I'm sure. My name is Nathan. I'm the MENA trainer for Macmillan Education, um, and I am the one that runs the MENA PD Academy, the Professional Development Academy, Academy which includes all of our back to school activities, uh, our online modules, uh, of which this webinar is a part of, uh, the podcast that we've got, there's one tomorrow, so if you haven't signed up for that, please do come along and have a coffee with us, um, and lots of other activities as well. I'm sure you know me by now. So let's look at the agenda for today. So we're going to look at the benefits of projects. I want to make sure that uh, we do a little refresher. We're not going to spend too long here. Uh, if you've been to the other project sessions, this is just a very quick refresher of those. What I want to do, though, is look at the difference between doing a project and project-based learning. And there's a difference between the two, and I want to make sure that we're absolutely clear about what those differences are and when we are using each. It's not, not to say that one is better than the other, but they have their own advantages, and it's good to know what they mean so that you can choose to do them if you wish. Of course, you want to know how to implement them. So a big part of this webinar will be around implementing a project-based learning approach. And to do that, we're going to look at it across an entire student's learning journey through school, not post-school, but through school. So how can we use projects with very young learners? How is that different to young learners, primary? And how does what they do in pre-primary feed into and support and scaffold what they can do in primary? And again, that will move on to teens. We won't spend very much time looking at teens, but it's still useful to see what's going to come after what we are doing with them as young learners. And of course, we all know that uh, a common complaint is, you know, they get to university, you know, and they struggle with project work. They may have a lot of English. They may be good at some of the academic work, but when it comes to working in, uh, together in a group, doing projects, you know, having to figure that out, students struggle. And, and a lot of that, I think, is because we're not setting them up correctly in those younger years, building those skills. And we will see many of them this evening. Good. Hopefully that's OK. We'll throw some tips in there as well, and we'll look at it some, uh, for, from a practical point of view. So let's get going. What are the benefits of project work? And I'm going to throw this question to you guys. I actually sent this up as a mentee, but this morning, uh, the, the group that we did this with preferred to put it in the chat box. So it's up to you. You can use the mentee if you wish, uh, and you can put up to 10 answers. Or if you wish, you can write them in the chat box. What are the benefits of using projects with young learners? Now, if you've been to the other sessions, this should be a nice, easy question for you. I'll give you a moment, have my tea. Say a very good evening to everyone who has joined us in the last few minutes. 
We've kicked off already, and we're looking at the benefits of using projects with young learners. Peer interaction, good, yeah, collaboration, working together. Let me head over to the Mentimeter. Let's see if people have put anything up there. See if any answers are coming through. There's a few there. Someone's motivation, communication, improving 21st century skills. That's a really good one. Let's look again at the chat box. Coming back again, going back and forwards. Uh, Natia, developing social skills, perfect, Cooper uh, cooperation, uh, working in groups, learning how to share. Yeah, it's a really good one, especially for young learners. Uh, searching, yeah, investigating, organizing, planning. There's a ton of stuff. We've got processing, critical thinking, taking learning outside of the classroom. Yeah, that uh, taking responsibility and going out and investigating yourself. Good. So there are tons of benefits to young, uh, to young learners for doing project work. I wrote down a few. It's certainly not an exhaustive list. I probably could double this list in a couple of minutes, but I put uh, they're motivating, they're engaging. Some of this stuff other people have already put. They're, they're nice, they're, they're personal so, and they're fun. So students often find them quite engaging working with projects. They can be challenging. If, they, if we think about the Vygotskyan uh, ZPD, we can pitch a, a project just above the level of abilities and knowledge of our students, Get challenge them. And I'll give you an example of that as we go through the webinar in a bit. Somebody mentioned that they, they're collaborative, which is great. They're communicative. They force students to use the language and they force students to use that language in a meaningful way yeah, because we can connect the project to the real world. It could be a real world question a real world scenario, a real world problem. And we have this problem solving. Um, I put that here as well. Uh, they have to negotiate, they have to make decisions, they have to show leadership qualities. Somebody also put some of these things. And they're a really great way to build students autonomy, giving them responsibility because they're students, uh, because they're learner centered, they're student centered. So there's lots of great benefits here to the student themselves. But there's many others as well that we could come up with very, very easily, I'm sure. I didn't put fun here, but we could put fun. And I tried to kind of come up with uh, some kind of quick and easy phrase. For me, young learners are social and active learners. They're social. They want to be interacting with their peers. They want to spend time with their friends. We mentioned that in the engagement webinar. But they're also active. They want to be moving around. They want to be doing stuff. They like hands-on activities. And we want to create a learning environment that uses all of the senses. It's very easy in English language teaching just to be focusing on the ears when we're listening and on the mouth when we're writing and on the fingers when we're right. Uh, sorry, on the mouth when we're speaking and the fingers when we're writing. But we need to be using all the senses. Can we get them outside? What kind of things can they hear? What can they smell? What can they feel? All of these things are very important. But on the flip side of that, they also value being given choices and responsibilities during their learning. In research with young learners, they always say, I want to be valued as, uh, as an autonomous learner. I want to feel grown up. They like feeling grown up. And when we look at some of the example activities, I'll highlight how we can uh, promote this sense of uh, maturity and be feeling grown up. I got another question for you. Can children of any, and I put school age because this morning I didn't put school age and we were like, well, a three month old baby clearly cannot do project work, but we're thinking about kind of post three, three years of age. Can children of any age do project work? That is straight in there with a yes. I'm inclined to, depending on their level, there could be. Yes, we got another yes here going on. I think children of any age can get involved in project work. And I think that as we look at this, uh, this workshop, hopefully everybody will agree with a yes. Everyone's kind of on the yeses at the moment. Feeding into what Nathia has just said, can children of any ability 
do project work? Now, this is a slightly more tricky question. So I'll give you a second. Might be a range of answers. This morning, there was a few yeses and a few noes. So it'd be interesting to see what people this evening say. Can children of any ability do project work? Yep, people are saying yes, good. And I, and I would say yes as well. And I think one of the interesting things about project work, especially a, a full project-based learning approach, is it can actually highlight abilities of students that we didn't realize that they actually had. And I think one of the nice things, and there's been a lot of disadvantages to the pandemic, to COVID, but I think it's definitely showed us that we need to think about uh, our young learners in a different way. We quite often think, well, they're very good academically and they're not very good academically. So they're strong and they're weak. They're high, they're low. And we categorize them quite quickly because of that. You know, and this whole pandemic has thrown that up in the air. Children that didn't do very well in the class maybe started to do better online. It's children that did very well in class maybe didn't start to do so well at home. And these kinds of scenarios has taught us as teachers, as educators, a lot, I think. So I would say, yes, they can. And, you know, if we're able to differentiate, if we're able to give them different ways to access the content, different ways to express themselves, then actually maybe we can learn new abilities from our students. I also think there's some other benefits. We, we mentioned some of the benefits to students themselves. You know, they're engaging, uh, you know, they can do problem solving, but I think there's some kind of higher level benefits. There's benefits to us as teachers. I kind of just mentioned them then. You know, they can help us to transition towards new ways of, of teaching and learning. Um, blended learning, for example, because we need to incorporate both in a project usually, uh, but also, it gives us another string in our bow. A project-based learning approach is one methodology that we can use to help us add a variety to our teaching. We're not just doing every unit, every unit's the same. We're gonna do PPP uh, and then, oh, I've, they're gonna do TTT now. Gives us lots of variety, gives us a lot, gives the students lots of variety as well. We mentioned about some of those life skills, and we know that employers are looking for that. For those of you that were in the thinking skills session, we looked at what employers want, and they want these kinds of skills that really come out in projects. Things like leadership qualities, uh, critical thinking, the ability to work as, in a team, the ability to work autonomously and take something and go away and do something with it and bring it back and get, ref uh, get feedback on that. Employers look for these types of soft skills. So it's good if we can be training them all the time. But I think there's some other beneficial side effects as well, things that we don't often think about, things that we don't really see going on, and things that we can't really measure. So things like students that engage uh, with project work at school, do they have healthier relationships with their siblings at home if they ask siblings to help them with their projects? Parents, the same. Does it influence uh, a child's relationship with their parents? All of these kind of subtle side effects which uh, projects may have uh, benefits towards. Of course, though, that sounds great. There are many challenges for teachers when trying to develop projects. I put in brackets there, what might these be? Because I don't mind pitching this question to you. What kinds of challenges do you guys face when trying to use projects with your young learners. And I'll give you a moment, actually, I think. It gives me a break to have a sip of tea. What kind of challenges do you guys face? Time, yeah. First one that came up this morning as well, time. It's so difficult to find time to do projects. And this is why we'll look at this project-based approach and the difference between that and doing projects themselves. Any other challenges people face? I've got a few on the next slide, so don't feel like you need to put them down. But if you face any personal challenges, it would be great to know what they are. But I would agree, time is definitely a big one. Motivation, yeah. How do you motivate 
students to do different things that can be very difficult. Good, and I'm sure people have other challenges as well. If you want to keep writing them, you are more than welcome. We're going to look at them in a minute, uh, but I want to look at the difference between project work and project-based learning very quickly. So again, this is a question that is a thinking question. So you don't need to write anything to answer this. It's just a reflective question for you personally. Think about how you currently use projects with your young learners. Now, I just mentioned a bit about challenges, but let's take a step back and think about how you actually do them. So, you know, where do you do you use projects? Do you use them um, at the begin at, during the unit, at the end of a unit, at the end of a semester, at the end of the year? Uh, how do you use it? Do you use it with a whole class? Do you use it with a group? Is it something that you reserve for higher level students or fast finishers? Is it something you set for homework? Um, lots of questions around how you currently use and i'm sure you know there's quite a few people in the room with us i'm sure each of you use projects in completely different ways which again is one of the really interesting things for me about talking about projects is that everybody has a different idea about how they use them where they use them why they use them what am i testing again if we think about joanne's uh webinar last week you know, thinking about assessment, you know, am I assessing their speaking? Am I assessing their writing? Am I assessing integrated skills? Am I assessing their ability to think critically? You know, there's lots going on within a project. How do I focus down and make sure I'm uh, giving them very clear outcomes for the project? It can be quite difficult, I think. Again, one of the previous webinars, Lukas, if anybody watched that, if you didn't go to macmillanenglish.com, and go to the webinar archive and look at the last, um, in your own time, watch the last two webinars. Lukas talked a little bit about the difference between project-based and task-based. So I don't really wanna spend any time here. Task-based learning is still great with students. It has its place, absolutely. I'm not saying one is better than the other, absolutely not. Tasks, I think, are more kind of reminiscent of standard things that go on within education. They're kind of convergent. Uh, they end with a single viewpoint. Uh, but they're, they're around completing a single task and focusing on authentic language. So they certainly have a lot of value because of that. Projects, however, I think are more divergent. We want multiple points of view. We're starting at a single point. It could be a topic. It could be a question. It could be a scenario. It could be a story. And we're, we want different points of view. We want students to be creative. And projects can contain many tasks, as Lukash said. And as he mentioned, the difference between projects really is the, the amount of time that they take. And if we look at project-based learning, we're going even longer in that timeline. And they've got steps. We review continuously. So you do a task, you review it, you do it again, you improve upon it, and you bring everything together at the end of the project. So there's a slight difference between the two. Now, when it comes to doing a project, and I think as somebody's put there, Natia's put, she tends to do them at the end of a unit. I think the most common uh, use of projects for young learners is to do a project rather than to use a project-based approach. Projects can obviously be individual. I could do a project right now. Uh, let's say this evening, I go home after this webinar and I'm a little bit bored and I think, oh, I'm gonna do a project. I'm going to, I don't know, make a photography website I don't need to collaborate or work in a group to do this. I could take the pictures myself. I could edit them. I could sign up to a website. I could design it. I could watch YouTube videos to find out what I need to do. Lots of things I could do by myself. A project can be individual if you want it to be, but it can also be group work. Now I've put that there because I think that's in the primary context, very often project work is individual pieces which are put together to make a group, perhaps a display or a mural or something like this. Very often each student has like something that they need to do. Let's say you're gonna make a washing line uh, and they have each have their own thing hanging on it. They make their own and they put it on the washing line. So it's a kind of group work, but with like lots of individual tasks within it, if that makes sense. A project is usually limited in scope. It's usually done within one lesson or it's set for one piece of homework as an extension. 
And often, as we've just mentioned, it extends a unit in the course book, and it's a way for students to work with content they've already learned. So in this scenario, doing a project usually exists in this format of, okay, we've got one week and we're gonna do unit five. I'm gonna do the unit with you. And then at the end, we're gonna do a project if we have time. This is where this idea of time, uh, the time, uh, can't think of the word. The, the fact that we don't have very much time feeds into this. So I did a piece, uh, sorry, I did a training with some teachers in Palestine a couple of years ago, and they were using a course book and there was projects in the course book. And again, you do two units and then you did a project. And I said to them, how do you guys use the projects? Um, how do they go with students? And it was pretty unanimous that they said, we never really make it to the projects. We don't have a lot of time. We spend our time, you know, focusing on the unit. And unfortunately, we never really make projects. And I think that's a real shame. Sometimes teachers do set the project for homework. They try to say, OK, we don't want to give them too many worksheets to do at home. So we'll kind of try to make homework fun and more personalized. Again, that's a bit of a shame that we cannot use it in class because it takes away that collaborative aspect. And we're going to look at how a project-based learning approach kind of flips this on its head, this idea of working on the uh, unit and then doing the project at the end. Somebody's put a voice. I hope you can hear me. Of course, we've already mentioned when we talked about challenges that there might be teachers that avoid doing projects. We mentioned time restrictions, but there are other things as well. I think personally, there's nothing more scary for a teacher than, you know, okay, I'm going to do a project with my students and you set them up and you give them groups and they go to their tables, you know, and they're working away, you know, and someone comes to observe you, a principal or a senior teacher, and they come in and they look around and they say, well, the kids look like they're busy, but no one's really using any English in here. So, and, and I think teachers can be a bit scared of that. You know, okay, there's a lot of noise. It's hard to control them. Uh, it, these kinds of things can make projects a little bit scary to use sometimes. And again, this idea of assessment, which we already mentioned. Ask yourself the question. You don't have to answer this to me, but do you, you yourself sometimes avoid doing project work? Do you sometimes think I could have done a project, but I kind of avoided it. I'll move on to the next unit and it's okay. I'll do a project another time. Ask yourself that question. It's good to reflect on. Challenge yourself, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So let's think about a project-based learning approach and how that is different to just doing a project with students or students doing a project. So I'll start with this quote. So some language, and this is from a guy called Stoller. This is pretty old, this piece of work. But this is what's very generally quoted when you look up project-based learning literature. Some language professionals equate project work with in-class group work, cooperative work, or more elaborate task-based activities. However, he argues that project work represents much more than group work. It says that it should be viewed as a versatile vehicle for fully integrated language and content learning. So he's kind of saying, actually, the project integrates everything that we want to do. So why don't we start there? So when I said that we can flip that methodology, let's not teach the unit and then do the project at the end if we have time. We're going to flip that around. We're going to see this as something that's integral to what it is that we're trying to achieve by doing that unit in the first place. So I would say I would feel very proud of any teacher who has the courage to go in and, and instead of saying to their class, OK, this week we are going to do unit five, healthy eating. Instead, they go in on the first day and they say, this week we're going to do a project and it's going to be a project around healthy eating. And everything you need to be able to do this project successfully is in unit five. And again, we were talking before about promoting this idea of autonomous learning. 
And this is a great way to be able to promote that with students. If you want to be able to do this project, you need to go and find out what is in unit five to be able to access it and see what they can actually do. If they cannot do certain parts, you are there as a guide, as a facilitator to help them, to guide them, to fill in the gaps, but don't do it all for them at the very beginning, I guess is what I'm saying. And of course, this is all built on this foundation of a growth mindset and not underestimating the abilities of our students. Young learners can do a lot if we give them a chance. That's what I believe. And this is what I was talking about, making the project central, not peripheral to the curriculum, making it front and center in terms of what we're trying to do and what we want them to achieve. And then students learn through the project. Yeah, there's no Googleable answer for them. When it comes to this project, they have to actually do the work. And that project can be connected to other things. For those of you who are with us for the story-based approach, a story-based approach and a project-based learning approach can work together. You could build the projects around stories. It's a very popular way of approaching project work. Yeah, think about things like the very hungry caterpillar, you know, how many projects feed off of that story. And teachers do this a lot, I think. But when we think about project-based learning, we're thinking not just about the product. So when we were talking about tasks, we were talking about coming down to a single viewpoint, the answer, perhaps on a test. Project-based learning is more focused on process as well as product, yeah? It's about getting them to see that we work through a process to be able to get to answers to projects. And this helps you as well with those students who, you know, they're, they're the good students. They're the ones that always get, you know, full marks. And they're the ones that like to stand up at the end and say, I know the answer to what we're doing. Actually, we're saying to them, well, there's more than just an answer. Were you able to work as part of a team? I'm going to give you points for this as well. I'm going to give you marks for your ability to support your peers to get to the same level as you, putting that ownership of co-teaching onto students, giving them, again, maturity, rather than them just being competitive and being like, well, I'm the best and you're not the best, breaking that down in the classroom. Again, we've got another quote here. So we're talking not just about final product, but process. And he's saying that it provides students with opportunities to focus on both fluency and accuracy at different project work stages. And that's really important because there's definitely always a debate on should I do fluency first and then accuracy before they do the test? Or should I do the accuracy and then fluency at the end? If think if we were talking about the uh, doing the unit and then the project at the end, if we're thinking about that methodology, I would say that's probably an accuracy to fluency uh, type of model. We want to kind of bring it all in, integrate everything, give them opportunities for fluency and accuracy along the way. So again, giving you more ammunition. Of course, the key to successful implement implementation is preparation. Good projects are well prepared. And that's not just in the English language classroom, that's everywhere. In my job, if I want to pull off a project, I need to prepare it well. I need to do a good plan, brainstorm, all of these types of activities. But when it comes to project-based uh, learning with changing the role of the teacher, again, unit to project, teacher-led very often, the teacher is going to be controlling when they access the content, what content they're going to be accessing. And then maybe we'll get to the project and I'll let you practice with that in, in, a, in a productive way. But in project-based learning, we're focusing on the learner. We're acting as a facilitator, which is what I mentioned before, and we're motivating them. Yeah, we're acting in that kind of very positive sense, guiding them through. We're doing this project on healthy, uh, healthy living. This is your topic. And I want at the end of it for you to have a poster. You can do whatever you want. Poster can look however you want. You can work with whoever you want. I will help you with whatever you need to get to that poster. Yeah, you just need to try and then tell me where you're struggling. And again, it's changing that whole role of the teacher. A few extra points. 
We know that it culminates in an end product. So there's process, but there is also this product. And we want this product to be a shared product. Again, taking away that individualism of, of learning and producing work. You know, they can produce shared pieces of writing. Writing doesn't always have to be an individual task. They can make posters, they can do plays, you know, they could make videos on their phones. All of these types of things are possible. These are the end products. Now, when we're thinking about project-based learning as opposed to a project, we really want that uh, product to be shared with an audience beyond the classroom. So project-based learning tends to, you know, it goes over multiple units. It could be a, a month, it could be a few weeks, it could be the whole semester, but we want really for them to be able to present at the end what it is that they've done to someone who's not in their class. It could be a parallel class, same age. It could be a different class within the school. You could work with another teacher. It could be parents. If it's the end of a semester, you could invite parents in and students can present their projects. It could even be the senior team, the principal, vice principal, senior teachers, uh, can give them feedback and, you know, and again, makes them feel very mature if they get that kind of high level feedback. In order for them to be able to do that, they need to be constantly reflecting on their work throughout the process. So project work is not like I'm going to do a piece of work and I'm going to write it and then you're going to mark it. We're constantly working together to make it better. So they do something for a, a lesson and then we talk about it. And then the next lesson, they can change it, adapt it. At the end of the week, again, peers maybe might give them feedback. So they do like a mini presentation. And we do this kind of thing in a working environment, I'm sure, as well. And again, we can also give them marks on their ability to assess their peers. So what kinds of questions do they ask? If they know that their marks are, and you know, they can be informal marks. You know, if they know that, oh, I'm being watched and the kinds of questions that I'm going to have to ask and the kind of feedback that I'm going to be giving to my classmates is important, then it makes them think about it, yeah? So you're pushing those critical thinking skills again. And whatever assessment you do should help them with the next project. So each project gets better than the one before. And again, when we talked about that fear of doing projects, this feeds into it. So yes, the first project that you ever do might be complete chaos, could be paint everywhere, and there could be fights and all sorts of things, chairs thrown. You learn from it, we adapt, and then we repeat. Yeah, and we keep doing that over and over again. Learn, adapt, repeat. Learn, adapt, repeat. Keep doing it. Learn, adapt, repeat. You guys can repeat that with me as well. We'll do some drilling. Learn, adapt, repeat. And I, I saw that uh, Joanne used a really great phrase, mini project managers. I love that phrase. You know, making students feel not like students, not like uh, individual students in the class, making them feel important, like mini project managers. I think that's great. Of course, we want projects to be creative. An, an important element aspect of, uh, of project work is this idea of creativity, that um, divergent thinking that we mentioned before. You know, and it allows students to act as authors and initiators. These are great words. Strengthen their creative endeavors, broaden their outlook, thinking about the world outside, you know, different influences. And those things will imp uh, impact and influence their language skills, which I think is really nice. So, you know, we're not just teaching them the language and then letting them get on with it. Actually, all of those things do influence their language, even if we cannot see it, especially when they're younger, pre-primary, going into year one, they want a lot of receptive work. Yeah. And we'll see the benefit of that later on. Yeah that early training, when they get to year two, year three, year four, all these language skills start popping out. Yeah, we start seeing them. We start reaping the benefits of all of that hard work that we've been doing. But of course, we need to make sure that it's structured. Students need a clear model. It needs to be very visible for them. Yeah, and make the steps visible too. Let them know what it is they're doing and how they're gonna get there. It's not like other pieces of work. Sometimes in other aspects of teaching and learning, you know, the teacher likes to hold on to, you know, like a secret, like I'm not going to tell them what's on the test and they're not going to know what we're doing in the next unit. Aha. Like it's a good way to keep control. Project work is about changing that. It's about making them see 
where they're going, what they're going to achieve, and how they're going to get there. And they can then analyze and reflect on those steps as they go. Now, of course, again, if we're doing longer term projects, we've got to have the buy-in of parents. Parents need to be involved. Parents need to be buying in. They need to be also understanding those things. They need to see that model. They need to see those steps. And they want their students, they want their students, they want their own children to achieve as high a, la a language level as possible. They want to see their, their children competent and confident communicators. And project-based learning, for me, really helps students to get some of that stuff out. Okay, so we're going to finish off project-based learning uh, as an idea. It does, if you look at any of the studies around project-based learning, usually results in higher engagement and deeper content knowledge. So it does have that uh, linguistic language element to it as well. It's not just about painting and having fun. It, it is rigorous, but it needs to be well planned. Let's make sure we're differ uh, differentiating. If they do something for an hour, it's probably a project. If they spend a month working through a complete process with steps, with reflection, um, uh, building things up, bringing things together at the end, then we can call that project-based learning. Okay, so I've talked a lot for about 15 minutes there. Whew, I need to take a break. So we're gonna watch a video clip together. And now before we do it, I want you to guess. So I wanna make sure everybody is still here and you didn't fall asleep while I was talking about project-based learning. So I want you to guess. I have uh, just out of sight, right here, down below, a piece of fruit. Anybody want to guess what piece of fruit I have? And I will give you some clues. If you want to make a guess, like straight up, what you think it might be with no help whatsoever, it's a slightly more unusual fruit. It's kind of roundish, I would say. Round, yeah, kind of round. Uh, you cannot eat the outside. You can only eat the inside. I wouldn't like to eat the outside. It's a bit strange looking. It's not smooth like, uh, like an orange, like someone's guessed. I wouldn't, yeah, you, it's not smooth. You cannot, you can't really roll it along the table. Not very well. A rock melon. What a great answer. Nope. I'd say this comes from Asia. I want to say Southeast Asia, but that might be a lie. I'm not sure. I think this one came from Sri Lanka, actually. It's kind of pink in color. And it kind of has what looks like little spiky leaves sticking out of it. Anybody want to have a guess? Pink, kind of spiky leaves, Asian fruit. Yeah, good, we got there, boom. A rambutan actually is a very good guess. I love rambutans. I used to eat them all the time when I was in Malaysia. Anyway, so I've got a dragon fruit with me. Here it is, delicious looking dragon fruit. In fact, I cannot wait to go home and eat it because it's been sitting on the desk here all day, tempting me. This video clip is all around the dragon fruit. Now, it's a part of a series of clips, actually. But let's have a watch. I want you to just, I'm going to ask some questions at the end of the video clip around what you think about it and whether you think it was a project, these kinds of things. But have a watch. It's about three minutes. It's on YouTube. In fact, I'm going to also post the link here in the chat box in case you cannot see or hear this. <laughs> Can you see in here okay? Today, Today you'll, be you'll be eating this. I've seen these before. I've seen these before. I don't even know what, I don't this, even is. Know what this is. What is this? What is this? Oh, I love oh, these. Oh, I love these. It tastes really it good, is in, really good in a smoothie. Pattaya? 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 Is that it? Oh my gosh, it's oh so weird shape. Some weird shape. Pink They're with pink spike with spike of my drinks. Kind of like, uh, like uh, 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 avocado. Uh, avocado. Kind of kind of but kind of squishy. It's like a rat. It's like a rat. Like fresh fruit out of the garden. It looks like a mini pineapple that's pink. Dragon fruit. Why am I eating dragon fruit? I've just seen it before on YouTube and TV. It's like a dragon fruit, I think. I got this live from the Guinness World Dragon, and I, I saw this, so I'm not scared to eat this. 
we have a freshly cut piece for you to try. Ew, it's disgusting inside of it. It looks like the inside of a kiwi. I didn't expect it to have seeds. I thought it would be something you actually bite into. It's a completely different color scheme, and it looks more gelatin-like than it is on the outside. It's still hard to do this, even though I know it's kind of, sort of good. <laughs> Get off. Tastes like a watermelon. I'm not a big fan of watermelon. Not as good as I expected it to be. <sighs> oh, that's mushy. It tastes kind of like this hair. Okay, yeah, it's good. I'd say a cantaloupe kind of tastes like it. It really doesn't taste that bad. Like, if you put chia seeds inside of a kiwi, that's what it tastes like. Hmm. Pretty good. It's yummy. It's really nice how the seeds are popping in your mouth. It's good. The texture is like a strawberry because of seeds. It's good. <laughs> I like it. Like, I could see like me going to like somewhere like Hawaii or like the Amazon and me eating this. I don't like it. Why don't you guys just let me eat spaghetti or something? You just tried pitaya. What? Huh? Better known as dragon fruit. Oh, that's what the other name for it was. It kind of looks like a tropical fruit, because the weird shape, like a pineapple is kind of shaped weirdly like this. They're called dragon fruit in America because their names in Asian countries translate to things like dragon scale or dragon crystal. Okay. Wait, were dragons real? Why do you think they call it those things? Looks like a dragon egg with leaves sticking out of it. I totally see scale because it's full of scales here. If it was called dragon crystal, I'd just take it home and I'd be like. Okay, I will stop it there. We don't go on too long. I can watch these videos all evening. There's a whole ton of them and some of them are hilarious. Okay, so. Let's come back to the presentation. Any initial thoughts from a project uh, work point of view? Anything that kind of struck you? Anything you liked, disliked? Hopefully my voice is back. Any initial thoughts on this video? I have one. I wonder if anybody will think the same thing. Good, yeah, you can watch it later, it's fine. Like it? Yeah, me too. I love it. It's brilliant. These and there's so many videos on the internet that can give you inspiration, give you ideas for very easy things to do with students, I think. Any other thoughts? Thank you, Reda. Very engaging, yeah, it was really engaging. Getting the children really like, we're talking about hands-on, but it's very hands-on, mouth-on even. So getting them not just to kind of learn the vocabulary, but interacting with that piece. I think very often in the language classroom, we will show them things like uh, a flashcard. So here's a flashcard, uh, it's a dragon fruit. I'll work on the uh, phonics maybe, if the duh sounds, I might, Bring in a piece of realia. It's bit, if we're online learning, I could show you. This is dragon fruit. I could cut it and show you the inside if I wanted to. Very often, we kind of end there because we're, like you say, under pressure of time. I move on. Now I'm going to do a banana. Now I'm going to do a melon. This is a really nice way of getting students interacting. My next question for you is, is this a project? Would you consider this video to be a project, what you are watching? Yeah. yeah, I think it's a project. Project, yes, 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 good. We're all in agreement that what these kids are doing is a project. Now, the next question is, is it project-based learning? So think about what we were just talking about a moment ago. Is uh, what these kids are doing project-based learning? This is a more difficult question. I would say it's a project. So we were talking about a limited time frame, 
you know, we were giving them pieces of fruit, asking them to describe it. I think these uh, students, probably most of them were um, first language speakers, but I would say that this doesn't, wouldn't stop you from doing this type of activity with second language speakers. We probably wouldn't get quite the sophistication of vocabulary. There was some really sophisticated vocabulary in that video. Um, one piece of vocabulary that I loved in particular was the boy who used the word spike a which I think he's actually made up. I don't think that's a real word, but I've never heard it before myself. I thought that was great, it made me laugh. Is it project-based learning? I'm gonna argue that this is a project and it's not project-based learning. It does have outcomes of a project itself, but I think if it were, we wanted to call this project-based learning, this activity would not be done with those students that you see. It would be done with a different group of students, like an older group. So the older group, let's say these students in the video were all grade three, for example. I don't know how old they were, but let's say, for example, they were all grade three. A grade six teacher with the grade six students sets the project using a project-based learning approach that says, we are going to make a video that we need to plan out. So it needs to have those sections. So it had the, you know, introducing the fruit. What do you think about it? Section two, the taste. Section three, the reveal. Yeah, there are parts to it, the video. And we're gonna use, we're gonna interact with year three students as our test subjects. Then I would call it project-based learning. So a group of students in year six would have to put every design and put together. They would have to choose the fruits that they're gonna use. They would have to set up how they're gonna record it. They would have to make the schedule. This is project-based learning. I think what the children in the video are doing is they're doing a project. Can you see the difference between the two? I hope so. Hopefully I'm describing that adequately. And I've kind of answered question three was, how might we make it project-based learning? I think the children in the class or in the activity itself are doing a project. Whoever made the video, we could do this video very easily with older students, older primary students. I think that would be a project-based learning activity. Hopefully that made sense. Okay, because we're kind of running out of time, let's look at that learning journey. And maybe we'll expand on some of that stuff here doing project with very young learners. We said, can we do it with any age at the beginning? Can it be done? I think the answer was pretty unanimously yes. Very young learners, pre-primary can do projects. We know they can because it's in some of the pre-primary course books like this one, Mimi's Wheel, for example. But we need to understand that we need to simplify the, um, the project itself. It's probably gonna get messy. We're probably gonna make mistakes that we need to learn from. But overall, yes, they can do them. There are definitely going to be challenges along the way, things like conflicts. You know, you've got a bunch of four-year-olds. There's probably going to be some conflict. There's probably a lot of noise. It can be difficult to regulate their behavior. And we, the more we do projects with young learners or very young learners, the better we get at these types of things, how to move them around the class in groups. That's a skill that I had to learn when I taught uh, nursery in the UK. You know, you have different stations. What happens when a child says, but I want to go to the painting station and you really want them to sit down at the writing motor skills station. You learn those things along the way. There are challenges. Work with the team, work with your other colleagues. Think about it ahead of time. Don't wait for that to become a problem. Don't say, right, we're going to do a project this week and I'm going to get them to do it. And then you're like, oh my God, this is chaos. I wish I'd never done it. Think about what problems may come up and work as a team to think about any solutions to kind of head those problems off before they become big problems, I guess. This is an example of a collaborative project in Mimi's Wheel. And when we're doing very young learner projects, we're really focusing on that collaborative, uh, cooperative uh, aspect element of the project. So here they've got to, this is something that I mentioned before, you have a washing line and they have to each contribute uh, whether they like hot or cold. So you could have a cold weather station, a hot weather station. They go, they do some activities around what it's like in cold weather, what it's like in hot weather. Uh, and then they can make something to put on the washing line. They can choose whether they like prefer hot, whether they prefer cold. And again, lots of uh, repetition of vocabulary, the hot, the cold, 
It can be feelings I like or I don't like, these kinds of things. Lots of opportunities for language. And the book, the course book, guides you and gives you lots of um, support in terms of what you need, what materials in advance. It gives you very visual instructions. Very young learners uh, don't have a lot of patience for, uh, for setting up activities. They want to just get going. They like want to run and get started. They want to get their hands dirty. We don't have a lot of time to show them. So we've got nice, clear visual instructions there. And again, we've got a lot of support in the teacher's books, how to give instructions, how to demonstrate, what to do while they're doing the activity, things like praise, uh, asking questions, you know, oh, what color is that? And I really like your, uh, your jumper, you know, this kind of thing. Give them lots of praise. It makes them feel engaged uh, and motivated. But we need to be patient with very young learners uh, and we need to make it very visual. There are studies, this one was done in Turkey, um, and they, again, this uh, echoed what we saw earlier, increased student motivation and increased vocabulary learning gains at pre-primary level. So they can learn all of that vocabulary that we want through the use of the project. You know, we don't need to pre-teach them all the vocabulary. Let's get them stuck in there. The stages of the project when it comes to very young learners, needs to be nice and simple. There's a preparation stage, we just mentioned, that we have very long, it needs a model. The execution part, make it personalized, get it hands-on using those senses. Make the presentation part interactive, but informal. I think when they're very young learners, it needs to be quite informal, no pressure. Yeah, let them join in if they wish, um, because we're still working on those um, receptive skills, as we mentioned. But there needs to be some reflective part. How do they feel? What did they like? What would they like to do again? Yeah. S starting those early self-assessment skills. So that's very young learners. Let's look now at kind of primary age. Primary age is great. Now we can start to get really creative with them. I'm gonna use the example from Give Me Five, which is one of the Macmillan uh, primary courses, which uses projects within the course. And again, we're pushing these collaborative skills. So instead of individual parts that come together, we're starting to get them to work together on um, elements of uh, productive work. And we're starting to bring out those productive skills, starting to get them to do more speaking skills, structuring that, giving them uh, scaffolded uh, models, this kind of thing. Again, building that autonomy and we're promoting creativity as we go. And there's lots of examples of how you can do this. This is an example from year one. And again, you can see a similar kind of uh, stages, like a plan, than you do in pre-primary, just kind of adding to it a little bit. We've got a little bit of extra kind of planning going on in there because they're starting to mature. Then we jump to kind of year three. And again, that maturity has reached another level and we can have this kind of investigative stage. Somebody mentioned this right at the very beginning, which is great. You know, we can actually, let them use the internet to research, uh, give them some questions and let them go home and do it and bring that information back to class to start uh, planning out their project. So they've got more patience to be able to do the investigation and planning stage. So we can start to draw that out and get them working together on it. Again, they plan, they create, they present, and there's kind of deeper reflection going on. And that reflection can be more structured than it would be with very young learners. We can start to make these kind of little charts and things like this, and they can self-assess themselves. Yes, I actually know a lot more. Mm, well, I didn't really enjoy that so much. My presentation was okay, but it wasn't as good as uh, that group over there, the orange group, yep, this kind of thing. So lots of good reviewing. And the last thing I wanna mention is about creativity. So as they, as they do go through primary, we can become more and more creative. So, and we can become, um, and our projects can become more uh, elaborate. They can become more complex for students. So again, keep, we're always building those skills up. Again, that ZPD. So we've got lower primary topics in the book could include describing people and family. It's very common. And I think when in, in lower prime, we do st still see projects quite a lot. So this creating a class family tree is quite a popular activity in year one. You quite often see this. 
when it comes to mid-primary, year three, year four, they're doing natural and man-made environments and directions. So they could, let's say, design a treasure map. And it doesn't need to be a drawn map. They're not all amazing at art. Actually, it could be a realistic treasure map that could be done in the class. It could be done in the playground. They could have to work in pairs and give them directions. Again, using prepositions of place, uh, using vocabulary of objects. Yeah, you've got to go around the chair. You've got to go under the table. You've got to go behind the tree. These kinds of, you know, all this language that we, they have the opportunity to use in a very real and meaningful way. So designing a treasure map is a really nice one for mid-primary. And at higher primary, the topics we've got in the book include things like free time, technology, and adventure. And one of the activities, the projects is to invent a video game. And again, I'm going to bring you back to what I was saying earlier about the difference between a teacher that goes in and says, okay, we've got our unit for the next two weeks on technology. And here are 12 technology related vocabularies. Here's the piece of grammar that I want you to work on. Here's some worksheets that you're going to do. You can do some activity book for homework. And at the end of it, we're going to do a piece of writing um, on, I don't know, using a phone in school. Is that engaging and motivating as two weeks when you're 10 years old? Or if another teacher comes in and says, for the next two weeks, we're going to invent a video game. There's a difference between the engagement. Ears are going to pop up. I'm 41. My ears will be like, whoa, invent a video game. I would love to invent a video game. What do I need to do? What vocabulary am I going to need? Uh, where am I going to find out ideas? Who am I going to be working with? This project changes the whole dynamic of the classroom. So sometimes maybe start there is what I'm suggesting. Okay, I want to pitch this to you because I think it's nice to have some interactive activities. I've got some topics for lower primary, mid primary and high primary. What kinds of projects could we do with them? So lower primary, camping, trips and holidays. What might we do with these types of students? What would be a good project here? I'm sure you've probably all done this project. There was a, it was a really nice one this morning, actually. What kinds of projects would you do with lower primary for these for this topic? We've got camping, holidays, trips. Anybody got any ideas? Everybody having a think? Right, it's got a good idea. I think for lower primary, the person this morning, actually, I'll give you the one that I put. Mine was very simple, make a holiday list. Yep, very kind of vocabulary based, nice and simple. They could work together, choose items for a holiday. Yep, shopping list for your holiday, perfect. Uh, one of the teachers this morning session suggested that they uh, set up a campsite in the classroom. So they like build little mini tents um, and they have to like organize what it is that they were going to eat, who was going to sleep where. It was a great project. I loved it. What a great idea. Very kind of, you know, uh, interactive and creative. And this is very much about getting creative. This is the suggestion in the book, but it doesn't have to be what you do. You could be thinking of anything, making a project around camping that gets them to use that language. Next one, mid-primary, animals, natural habitats, and visiting places. So these are the topics that they're working on. A menu. What kind of projects might you do with your students for these topics? I should have bought a knife. I could have cut up and eaten my dragon fruit while I'm waiting. Taking a trip, yeah. Nice to get out of the classroom. The one suggested is to design a zoo or a safari park. And I think this is a really nice um, activity as well. And in fact, you could get quite creative with this. So instead of saying, okay, this week we're going to design a zoo or a safari park, you split the class in half. Okay, this side of the class, you're going to design a zoo. This side of the class, you're going to design a safari park. And then we're going to compare. How are they different? How are they similar? What's in each? You know, what kinds of things would you do in your zoo? What kind of things would you do in your safari park? Loads of opportunities then 
for students to engage with each other, to be communicative, to use all that language. They could watch BBC documentaries, loads of things that they could do uh, for this project. And again, those topics would all be uh, covered. And the last one, higher primary in entertainment and describing personalities. We're running out of time, so I'm gonna give you this one. The project you could do here, create a TV series. So, you know, you're working with uh, grades five, grades six, put them in groups. They can create a TV series. Again, brings a lot of their personality in, brings in aspects of their personal life, what they like to watch. Uh, again, there's lots of, uh, yeah, describing person, uh, describing celebrities. Yeah, and then each group can present the, the TV series that they've created, and then they can have votes around who likes which one the best, uh, all these kinds of things. Loads of great creative opportunities to get students engaging, not just with the language, but the topic in general, and engaging with each other. And again, this is an example of one of them. This is the holiday list. It's there taking you step by step through that particular activity. Stages, same as for very young learners, but perhaps a little bit more emphasis at the beginning um, and a, a lot more sophistication to the project itself. Teens, I don't really have a lot of time for teens, but when it comes to teens, we want those steps to be really drawn out and we want them to be student-led, student-centered. So we're not coming in and saying, uh, the project for this week is what was one from before, uh, design a zoo or design a safari park students and the teachers working together to agree on those themes. Their students also contributing to determining the final outcome and the structure. So a lot more um, involvement on the students part and a lot you know, more in-depth information gathering, analyzing data. You know, if we think about the project that I mentioned uh, around the dragon fruit, you know, those year six students, or if you're including secondary students, and getting them to do it with younger students, you know, they need to think of all sorts of things. They can compile and analyze that data. Who liked what, who ticked what boxes, these kinds of things. And here's an example from one of our courses. This is Get Involved, which is a secondary course. And you can see, you know, uh, the steps are a lot more uh, structured, scaffolded. Uh, there's a lot more steps to go through, but they still have that model, yeah. So they still need to see very clearly, even though they are a lot older. Okay, good. So to end the session, we know there are lots of benefits to pro uh, project-based learning. We've mentioned many of them uh, from academic to soft skills. I think any age or ability can do them. We just need to be adventurous and give them the chance. It prepares them for the future, gives them loads of great skills. Let's be very clear about the difference between doing, doing a project and project-based learning. I think for me, they're not the same. Um, they both got their advantages and disadvantages, but if you can bring in real project-based learning, your students, I think, will really flourish. Think about that process, think about the product, involve students in that process and build up, start small. If you haven't done many projects in the past, start with very small projects and then see how you can build on them. And, and again, involve students in that as much as possible. If we think about the learning journey, when they're young, it needs to be simple, it needs to be visual. When they're in primary, we can get really creative, get them creative as well. You'd be surprised what they can come up with and how that language will start to come out. And then when they're teens, so year six going into secondary and teens, explore their emerging personalities, make it very personal. And you will again, get much more out of teens when it comes to project work. Okay, we whizzed through that. I hope people have got some great ideas and that people are gonna be using projects more and more uh, throughout this academic year. I hope it's given you some ideas. I hope that it's given you this idea of, oh, I'd really like to do some more project-based learning this year. If you do want to do more project-based learning, you will see at the top, a green bar that has just popped up. If you haven't registered for the free using project-based learning module that is uh, going at the moment, I'm gonna close registration tomorrow. So tomorrow's the final day to register. And then we will be working for the next few weeks because schools are gonna be going in and starting. 
and you'll have get those, you know, the first few weeks out of the way. And we can think about doing um, some projects with students. So we'll set you some tasks. You can look at those stages and then we will reflect on them together. We will give you feedback on your reflections. So certainly sign up to that module. It's free. It's very simple, uh, simple in design. And I will look forward to seeing you all throughout that module, talking to you individually, personally. There's office hours in there as well. So you can have one-on-ones with me for 15 to 20 minutes and tell me all about your project use. I would love to get your feedback on how you use projects now, what ideas you have for using them this year and how that goes. All of these things are really important for us to help each other. That's it from me for today. If anyone's got any questions, my email address is there. You're more than welcome to put them in the chat box and we'll address them now if we have a little time. Uh, but you can contact me through the Academy itself, get in touch with me, uh, get in touch with the group even on Facebook. If you've got a question, it doesn't have to just be me, put it to the community, see what other people think. But of course, if it's something more personal, you can email me as well. Don't forget the Academy. We've got the new website. I know a lot of you have been on there, which is great. It's still very small at the moment. And as this academic year progresses, we're gonna be filling it in with a lot more of the kind of course material, support for Global Stage, Mimi's Wheel, Share It, uh, all of these types of courses. We will start to upload more support uh, for those courses. And again, the modules are there. There's two there already. You can do self-study. We've got two going on live at the moment. They will become self-study afterwards. And we'll be doing two more in the spring semester as well. ELT time, the podcast, it's tomorrow. If you haven't signed up, please come and have a coffee with us. 2.30 uh, Dubai time. And I whizzed through this uh, presentation at 500 miles an hour. So hopefully everything was good for you. You enjoyed, you got great ideas. And this was the final back to school uh, session, but we will be back in October with the Advancing Learning Academic Program, which will run over the whole school year. And again, there's tons of material coming up. There's stuff for uh, Global Stage, uh, Get Involved, Gateway to the World, loads of things going on. So keep in touch with the community and keep in touch with us. In the meantime, I wish you all the very best back to school. If you've already started, I hope everything's going well. If you're in Egypt and you're gonna go back in a couple of weeks, best of luck to you all. Please get in touch with me. I'd love to hear from each and every one of you. I'm always intrigued by the things that you're doing. And for me, that is a good night and thank you very much. And I will see you all again very soon. Take care.